Facebook is an idealistic and optimistic company. For most of our existence, we focused on all of the good that connecting people can do. Mr. Zuckerberg, what is Facebook doing to prevent foreign actors from interfering in U.S. elections? If you messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that may be what this is all about. Do you believe you're more responsible with millions of Americans' personal data than the federal government would be? The early internet is really interesting and fascinating to study. It was a time where pretty much everyone who was involved was really optimistic about what it could mean. The web is going to be the defining social moment for computing. It would give free access to knowledge to people whenever they needed it. It suddenly seemed to shrink the world. And suddenly, even being a part of vast distances from people didn't matter as much. Move fast and break things, kids coming out of dorm rooms and starting companies. All the walls that used to separate people from information and from each other were being broken down and used to create again a new, open, egalitarian world. American society, American political culture allowed these companies to grow and to mediate all our interactions now that we have. People were thinking like, is technology good for us? Is the internet good for us? This will change everything. I think it was clear that the main goal was like to get it to a stable version and monetize it. Business is working well. The majority of our revenues, of course, are in advertising. No one really knew how fast things would evolve. No one really knew how quickly, basically how willingly, uh, platforms were willing to kind of like sell out users. When I first started covering Silicon Valley, I began to try to understand how Silicon Valley companies like Facebook and Google made money. What was their business model? The earliest moment that I can remember when privacy became an issue um, in the internet experience was in 2004 when Google launched Gmail. Uh, and it was going to do that, it was going to finance this by, by essentially reading all your emails and then serving you targeted advertising. This was a new thing for most people because people didn't realize how Google was financing its operations until then. And suddenly people became much more savvy about what was happening on the internet. A decade ago, like 15 years ago, I would not have thought this was possible. Not just in terms of ethically, but also technology-wise. Changing your privacy settings at this point is, you know, like rearranging the chairs after Titanic, you know, in a way. Not only because already a lot of this data has been collected and curated, but also because even when you change your settings, there are ways for people uh, to still scrape information from these websites. The thing that um, is interesting to me the most currently is the result that algorithms play in the formation of these online communities. The way these algorithms work is they find patterns in data by looking at what humans have provided them as kind of examples. This is one area where bias could actually be introduced into algorithms. If you think of a word like CEO and a word like man, most likely uh, what you will see if you map them into this uh, vector space is that you have man here, most likely CEO is going to be very close to man but very far away from women. Looking at this type of algorithm, you could also envision how a system like Google would start to use these type of results. People are really pushing forward for these algorithms to be used in every facet of human life without actually understanding fully the consequences. Social media has the power to bring people together, formally, like, without a voice. We've seen, like, hopeful stories like the Arab Spring. We've seen the Me Too movement, we've seen Black Lives Matter. The internet is a great organizing tool. Are we better off now after the internet has come into existence than we were 30 years ago? Well, it's changed it, it's made some things much better, but again, influence is how it makes money. 
platforms generally need to acknowledge that they have responsibility. Users should have a reasonable amount of trust in a platform, in a service they're using, that their data is not being sold. Some of these companies have started to realize the role that they've played and are moving towards implementing solutions to that end. Here's the question that all of us got to answer. Given what's happened here, why we should let you self-regulate? Well, Senator, my position is not that there should be no regulation. Okay. I think the internet is increasingly Do you embrace important. regulation? We're going to begin our program with one of the forefathers of virtual reality. He was there in the beginning, since the early 1980s, I believe. He helped craft a vision for the internet as a way to bring people together. He's a scientist, a musician, and an author. And his new book is 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Please welcome Jerome Lanier. Jerome, good to see you. Hello, hello. You said that we don't have to throw the whole thing away, but you also say that this internet AI has turned us into Pavlovian dogs carrying around devices suitable for what you call mass behavior modification. What do you mean by that? Ah, well, there was a time when we used uh, the mail, and I should point out, when you sent a letter by mail, nobody else read it. You paid for it, but it was strictly your business. It was a remarkable thing, almost unimaginable today. Uh, <laughs> so in those days, you could find yourself uh, under observation by somebody who's trying to be sneaky and manipulate you. Um, one way to do it would be to volunteer for a psychology test in the basement of the psych building on campus, and then some undergraduates would be behind the, the one-way mirror trying to get you to do something. <laughs> or you could get into an abusive relationship, or you could join a cult. Um, you could find yourself on the wrong side of an interrogation desk. Um, you, there are all kinds of ways it could happen, but they were all l very localized and unusual. Um, now, <clears throat> it's happening to everybody. Everybody is under constant observation and constant manipulation, albeit, let, to, just to be very clear, it's slight. So, uh, at this point, uh, the degree of observation is less than in the scenarios I just described, uh, although it's getting more so every day, but uh, so so just, the thing is, uh, slight differences, slight behavior modification applied consistently over time can shift society. It's like compound interest. At any particular moment, you might say, oh, how much difference could it make? So I saw an ad from the Russian uh, intelligence warfare people, so it got me a little cranky over something or other, who cares? But cumulatively, it does have a statistical effect on the whole society. Um, and then as far as why I'm asking people to quit, I'll tell you why, it's because I love Silicon Valley. I love making digital products. I've sold a company to Google. I'm working with Microsoft. I adore my community. It's my home. And I don't want you to be passive sheep customers. I want you to be demanding tough customers, and I want you to make us work to make you happy. And right now, you're all turning into passive sheep, and it bugs me. All right. because so if you quit, you're at least prodding us. You're at least not just sitting there passively accepting, accepting whatever we feed you. So I think it would be better for us. So I want, I want you to challenge us because that, that way we're not disconnected from the world anymore. Can you see that? Like when you engage with Silicon Valley, when you're tough, you're actually saving us from being like abandoned on some desolate island of the super empowered. You know, and <laughs> like you actually help us. You actually, you actually reconnect the world. Uh, to get precise about what you're saying, the trend lines are being watched in how we do respond in tiny bits, are being watched by algorithms that can see what the trend is pointing to and so it subtly changes our behavior. Is that how it yeah, works? yeah. The way it works is um, uh, there, there, there are very few sort of um, sneaky people in cubicles trying to figure out how to manipulate you uh, directly. I mean, there are the Russians have some in their employ, but the much more common thing that makes the whole system work is algorithms. So the algorithm will do a little bit of random stuff. It'll say, well, uh, during what time of the month is this person more uh, susceptible to this kind of pitch? What about other people who correlate with this person in some ways? And all of these correlations turn into this statistical um, 
I wouldn't call it a model of you because it wouldn't pass muster as a scientific model, but it's kind of a, a, a predictive portrait of you that can be used slightly reliably. I mean, this stuff is only barely better than random, but, but it is a little better than random. And so it gradually finds a way to engage with you. We use the word engage instead of addict. What I mean is addict. We gradually addict you through algorithmic exploration until we find whatever it is that'll, that'll get you. Uh, what's the business model behind all of that? Well, <laughs> the business model is uh, it's really kind of interesting. I've had occasion to be uh, at the, these events where all the Silicon Valley companies sell their biggest advertisers big package deals for the next year. And it's an amazing spectacle to behold because each of the companies in turn, Facebook and Google and so on, will grab a stage and then present to the biggest advertising buyers. Often, I, I kid you not, with dancers and special effects, it's like this big production. And if you listen to the way the companies talk about what they can do to their own customers, the advertisers, you hear hear this extraordinary bragging, like we can really nail in on a person, we can get them to do something, we can, you know, and it, it's actually a little exaggerated. Um, and then the public face is, oh, no, 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 we only do things in your interest. But, but it really is kind of two-faced. There's this, there's this very aggressive way that the companies sell themselves. And I think what happens to the advertisers, to the people who are putting all this, these many billions of dollars into the system, is they get scared because they're thinking, oh my God, if we don't pay into these companies, it's like we won't exist. It's kind of like um, an existential version of a mafia uh, sort of protection racket. Uh -huh. You know, it's like you're saying, like you pay us or nobody will know about you. And so um, I think while the official version is that we're giving you the ads that are more useful, and then the sales version is we're able to mind control people for your benefit, the actual truth is we're going to scare you into thinking if you don't give us money, you'll cease to exist. So I think those are the three different versions of the same business plan. And if I'm not mistaken, you've actually written somewhere that all of this is turning us into, these are your words, quote, you said, into assholes, unquote. Right. Well. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to sound presidential. <laughs> <laughs> and I, should, I should say something about that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see that. <laughs> um, what happens is uh, when you get somebody addicted to something, whether it's an opioid or social media, their personality changes. They get kind of cranky and selfish. There's this thing. Anybody who's known an addict for, is, will recognize this. And social media addicts do tend to get this quality. Um, which is some call, sometimes called the snowflake personality, where it's, it's almost like they're asking for a fight. Um, they want attention so badly. And, and so it, it does kind of make you into uh, that thing that was mentioned. And I've heard you've pointed out that some of the tech titans, of which there are not that many, don't let their kids go anywhere near technology. And right now, some of my friends in the industry are shocked. I, I kind of let my daughter do whatever she wants. I figure she has to learn her own lessons, and they're shocked. Like, you let her have a phone? I'm like, well, you know, she's going to have to figure it out. But a lot of people are like incredibly anti-tech within the tech community. It's, it's, it's rather remarkable. And you've also said that this is approaching something like uh, the divine right of kings, turning us into um, people who uh, are following without realizing that we're following, but we're just giving over to it anyway? It is the strangest thing. Like, um, I don't have anything against uh, the individuals I'll mention, because a lot of them are people I know, and I, but it's, it's really weird. Like, one of the tech companies is the first large public company controlled by a single person and has all of this power, and like, why should that be so? It, it, it's a very peculiar thing, but we had such, such a, um, a fervent belief in the myth of the hacker cowboy who would dent reality in the words of Steve Jobs that somehow we're, we're enacting it. One of the things I'm a little concerned of, actually, is that um, sometimes when, peop when a society uh, chooses like uh, figures to be godlike figures, uh, then they'll tear them down. So they'll elect a Mussolini and then hang the Mussolini, or they'll uh, elect the Aztec uh, prince for a year and then, and then sacrifice that person. And I, um, I'm a little concerned about some kind of uh, some kind of wave of hatred against tech, which would be totally inappropriate because we actually are doing something important. What I, what I, th what I ask is not to hate us, but to engage us and force us to be better. You know, that's the much better scenario. I can understand that, yet we've seen examples lately where it's being pointed out to us that the smartphones conveying what they're able to convey are turning, uh, in, they're turning into propagators of maniacal social violence, weaponized in Myanmar.
mm -hmm. the Rohingya problem. And in South Sudan, social media is literally a deadly weapon in South Sudan. Explain that. Yeah, so this has been one of the awful things that's happened. Um, early on, there, uh, so uh, Silicon Valley is part of the Bay Area in California and tends to swing left, right? And very early on, there was this, um, I would say uh, a certainty that if you just let people talk to each other, um, it'll create positive leftist changes in the world. And uh, one of the first great triumphs of that was the Arab Spring. Like, oh, we'll just give power to the people, they'll overthrow dictators, they'll create this beautiful democracy. Now, the thing is, the algorithms that are watching participants in something like the, uh, the Arab Spring aren't left or right, they're not humanistic, they have no feelings at all. They're just trying to find any path to maximize addiction and maximize influence algorithmically, just through searching. And eventually, they discover, the algorithms discover in a blind algorithmic way that the negative emotions, the negative people are easier to engage. And so everything starts tilting towards amplifying those people. So you'll have an ISIS that gets even more mileage from the same tools that propelled an Arab Spring. Or you'll get a resurgent KKK and neo-Nazi movie that gets even more mileage from the same nexus of communications that propelled the Black Lives Matter, All right, is, a, is, a, is an example that's, that happened here. And we see this again and again can, can I get just slightly geeky for a second? Please, please. Uh, okay, so... Um, but you in, geeks have given this to us, so... Yeah, yeah, okay. So, well, then thank you for giving us another chance to screw you up here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in classical behaviorism, um, the, the earliest experiments used things like candy and electric shocks to give people stimulus in response to what they did to change their behavior, right? That's the Skinner box. Um, now, we, we don't yet have drones hovering over people dropping candy or electric shocks on them, right? That's coming, uh, but it's not here yet. So we use symbols like uh, analogous to Pavlo's bell, but we use uh, social experience to give people little dopamine hits, as we call them in the trade, the little positive feeling when you get retweeted or something, and then the negative ones when you get um, treated badly, when you get... Um, uh, when you get uh, harassed online, uh, insulted. And so the thing is that in, in a broad sense, positive and negative uh, uh, stimuli are both powerful in people, but they have different time profiles. So what happens is the positive ones can take longer to build and can be broken more quickly, and the negative ones can come up faster. So it's, it's faster to get startled or scared than it is to relax but it takes longer to build trust than it takes to lose trust. So you can see they're, they're reverses. And so since the algorithms are responding on a rapid feedback loop, they select out and amplify the negative stuff, and that's why ISIS gets more mileage than the Arab Spring, and that's why the Klan gets more mileage than Black Lives Matter. Do we have to step away and abandon the free model? I, uh, I think there's a variety of possible solutions. The one that I'm really interested in is changing the underlying business model. So if you have an underlying business model where the only way you can make a penny, <laughs> I mean, what we're doing now is so insane. Can you imagine if in the old days, if you mailed somebody a letter, instead of buying postage, the letter would be free, but some, some customer would only pay money if they were confident they could change the letter in a way that they would influence events. That would be extraordinary, right? But that's exactly what we've done. Right now, if you and I are to have contact over the internet, this thing that's supposed to be open and free, the only way that can be financed is by a third party who we don't know about who wishes to influence us both. And so once you have that business model, it's like this red carpet invitation to the Russians and other bad actors and the Klan and whoever to use it because they can get incredible mileage out of it of a disruptive and negative sort. So. Bring back postage. Make it paid. Let pay. Sp um, so, uh, in the old day, in the in the days when Facebook was being founded, everybody thought that the way movies and TV would be created would be like the Wikipedia. It would be this massive volunteer free thing. Everybody in Silicon Valley, not in Hollywood. Um, we had an honest test. That was tried. A lot of people tried to do that, but then we had Netflix, HBO, Hulu, etc. And it turns out that when people pay for TV, we got this thing called peak TV. We, we, we did an honest test. We got an honest result. So what I want face, Facebook to turn into, I don't want the good stuff in Facebook to disappear. I think there's a lot of extremely positive stuff that happens on, on social media. I want it to turn into a cross between Netflix and Etsy. 
I want you to pay for it like you pay for Netflix so you can get peak social media, but if you do something special that means a lot, I want you to be able to get money for your craft like you would on Etsy. So I want, I want that to be the future of Facebook. Sounds good, but to get a little bit realistic. That would take an awful lot of change. Do you think any technology company would actually go for this? They'll do better. I mean, this is just normal capitalism. Like, it's like this idea of people coming in from the side and getting in the middle of everybody and manipulating society as the only business model is not capitalism. It's some bizarre, dystopic thing. I mean, it's, this is just, I'm suggesting just normal capitalism. Like, people pay for stuff they like and they have a choice about it. It's just normal. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I, I think it would be better for Facebook. It would be better for Google. I think it would be better for everybody. I think their shareholders would be happy. I think it, it's just a better solution. If we could figure out how to have that happen all at once. But let me ask you one other question. All right. You've said that this is all making politics impossible as we understand it. And I must say, because the, the way the, the rights of individuals for voting and all was conceived in an age when we didn't have any of this magical stuff, it's changed the definition of politics almost. Yeah, I mean, we live in a bizarre world now that just happened recently. I feel sorry for young people who couldn't experience the contrast with what came earlier, where nothing seems real, everything, everything seems like it's uh, manipulated by unseen forces, um, everybody's on edge all the time. Now, not, not that we had utopia before, but we had a little bit more reality. And uh, I, uh, we must get back there to survive. I, I don't see how we can survive if we're insane. But one big question is whether anyone's criticism will matter. So there's this bit of a confusion on this matter. Sometime in the Silicon Valley atmosphere, there's this thing like, well, if you're optimistic, it means you're complacent because you're sure things will work out automatically. It'll just naturally get better. I don't think that's ever been true. I think we have progressed and things have gotten better, and the various trend lines of betterment are very real, but every single increment of that betterment was due to somebody putting their foot down and saying things can be better. Jerome Lanier, thank you very much for joining us and ending hey. on the positive note. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. So, what is the science behind these AI systems that are impacting everything from the news you read Healthcare, who gets hired, promoted, deported? What does living in a world run by algorithms mean? Joining us now to dig deeper into all of this, director of the Harvard MIT Ethics and Governance AI Initiative and the Google former the former Google Global Public Policy Lead for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. Please welcome Tim Wang. Tim? <clears throat> co-founder of the AI Now Institute that's based at NYU. She is a research scientist and founder of the Google Open Research Group. Please welcome Meredith Whitaker. <clears throat> Aviv Oveda is chief technologist at the Center for Social Media Responsibility at the University of Michigan School of Information. He has worked and proved, provided research from Amazon, for Amazon, the MIT Media Lab, for Morgan Stanley, Quora, Yertle, the Toe Center for Digital Journalism, and Google. Please welcome Aviv Ovedia. <clears throat> and last but not least, a professor of law, business, and economics at Villanova University. He's also an affiliated scholar of the Center for Internet Society at Stanford Law School. Please welcome Brett Fishman. And let's start with Brett. Your book, Reengineering Humanity, posits that technology is turning us into machines. Is it? Well, the, the idea behind the book is to, say, is to get us to ask ourselves uh, how often in a life you, you feel like or you behave as if uh, automatically or comparable to, to a machine, right? So the idea of thinking about um, you know, am I performing uh, a script? Uh, am I behaving habitually or automatically? And if so, who, who wrote that script? Um, so the idea is to think more and more about how the technical systems, the world we're building, or really engineering for ourselves affects who we are as human beings uh, and how we think, how we relate to each other, how we interact with each other in different settings. Tim, let me ask you about the good and bad AI seems to be a label that's put on everything these days. It sure is. <laughs> what, does, what does the term AI really mean in the context that we have here? Sure. Training computers, 
to perform tasks. How do you train a computer? That's right. So when you talk about AI, it's important to keep two things separate. Uh, one of them is the, the marketing of AI, which is uh, what you're referring to. And then there's the sort of computer science of AI. Um, and really, that, that is a subfield of artificial intelligence uh, that's known as machine learning. And the, the basics of machine learning that you need to know is it's sort of the study of algorithms that get better the more data that they see. So the notion is if you want to teach a machine to understand uh, how to recognize a cat in an image, uh, you show it lots of images of cats. Um, and there's a certain set of methodologies that are used uh, to allow it to kind of accomplish that task. And really, that's the sort of subfield that's been driving uh, really a lot of the progress that you've seen in the last few years. These machines are learning. They're learning machines. How does that really work? Uh, so a lot of it is based on the recognition of what's known as features. So for example, uh, if you imagine trying to recognize a cat, the example that I just gave you earlier, uh, back in the day, the idea is that you get a bunch of programs together to think about how they recognize a cat themselves. And then they'd program explicit rules into a machine. So they'd say, well, a cat's fuzzy, and a cat is usually these kinds of colors. And you'd actually put those rules in. Um, one of the unique things about machine learning, though, is that it's able to identify these features sort of by itself. After lots and lots of examples, machines can do sort of what they call inference. They're able to say, well, in all the cases that I've seen, these are the types of things that are associated with cats. And it turns out that once you do it that way, you get these systems that are much, much better than we had before uh, in doing these types of tasks. Better? Smarter? Hmm. Um, sure, uh, defend, depending on how you define smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of our problem here today. Hmm. So Meredith, you've said that we've rushed these technologies into some of the most sensitive areas of our lives. I'm I'm going to um, ask your permission to go off script immediately and sort of you answer the question you asked to Tim, because I think we need to sort of set up Fine. where we are right now socially and Fine. politically, um, and then we can get into some of the examples. Um, but when you, know, when you ask what AI, now, what AI is, you know, I have been in the tech industry for almost 12 years now. I have thought a lot about these issues. Um, that's not an easy question to answer, even for somebody who is sort of enmeshed in these technologies. And that's partly because while it's an old field, you know, over 60 years old, um, it is kind of newly adopted in the last five to 10 years. And everyone can attest to this. You can't pass a newsstand without seeing, you know, another shiny white robot and some promise of kind of singularity futures, right? Um, and I think we have to ask, okay, why is this, <laughs> right? Why did this just crop up like mushrooms everywhere we go? And when you ask that question, you begin to see that, oh, this happened right around the time that big tech corporations were consolidating, that this business model had sort of taken over, and where finally you have these sort of organizations that have incredible compute power. They have supercomputing infrastructure. They are actually able to process the massive amounts of data that is needed to, as Tim said, sort of train these systems to recognize patterns. Um, they have this data because they have vast market reach. And they're able, you know, from Facebook to Google to, you know, whatever other app you've installed, they are able to continually collect huge amounts of data. They have the infrastructure to, sell, to store it, and then they have incredibly talented engineers that they can afford to pay to build these algorithms. So we look at this as sort of a commodification of a you know, earlier, fairly theoretical kind of, you know, I would say, you know, not, not a prominent branch of computer science for many years that suddenly became marketable. And so we have to ask, when we look at AI, whose stories are we hearing? And a lot of times what we're hearing are the stories that are written by the marketing departments of the corporations that have recognized the marketability and the profitability of these, you know, these techniques that have been around for a while. And that raises questions of motive. For example, you have written and spoken about the fact that there are algorithms that claim to be able to discover which people are more likely to commit a crime. Absolutely. Um, and you have to ask, you know, if you look at you know, one, of, one of the sort of you know, companies that has claimed to be able to do this, and there are sort of researchers and sort of you know, businesses that are looking at this as a technology is Axon, which used to be called Taser, which has a huge cache of police body cam data. 
So they acquired two AI companies about a year and a half ago and are busy creating sort of real-time facial recognition systems that will accompany, that will analyze the data captured by police body cams. Now their premise is, hey, police encounter criminals. We have this data set that will then model criminality. We'll train the AI to see what a criminal looks like. If you're thinking like eugenics, physiognomy, phrenology, you're right. Um, and then we will be able to identify pre-crime. Innocent until proven guilty. Sounds like it's under some kind of threat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think this is part of the concern around the sort of marketing of it, right? Because yeah. I think there is such a big feeding frenzy over uh, the promise of the technology, and that's often quite at odds with what the technology can actually do. And so I think part of the concern is that you actually see this technology being deployed in all sorts of situations where um, it's, it's not ready for prime time. It may not ever be ready for prime time. I think we have to ask the categorical question of even if it worked as well as we believed it did, would it still be something we'd want to do? And its effect on the labor force, unemployment? You know, again, stepping back just a second, one of the real issues with sort of speaking categorically about these things is that they are being deployed without our knowledge. So we don't know how often we encounter a system that classifies us, and as the classified, we don't often know that the you know, results, the, the opportunities were given or denied, the resources were given or denied, were actually informed by an algorithmic backend system. There is no transparency about these systems. We don't have standardized ways to measure them, and they're often sold by vendors to businesses without informing the public. This is a huge issue. Um, I can talk about their, you know, what we do know about their impact, but I think we need to sort of level set there that there is a huge need for transparency and accountability. Uh, Aviv, and then, uh, do you think that people, since we've heard about the Facebook scandal and we've heard about some of the things, do you think people do understand this threat better now? I think far better than they did, let's say, three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, year and a half ago. Like I'm. I'm the, the good part of you know, a lot of the current crises is that at least people are more aware of the way in which you know, technology is impacting their day-to-day, -day, what information they consume, how they're being manipulated in some cases, and also the recommendation systems that affect like, what they see and what they believe. Um, and I think that, that just the fact that algorithm has become a word that m many people know is, is a new phenomenon, I think, over the last year. I think that, that is very valuable because in the same way that government is a word people need to know. Algorithm is a word people need to know. A small handful of people who are designing a lot of these come from, well, they're white men in the Bay Area. As the woman of the panel. <laughs> 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 yes, they are. And they're white men in the Bay Area in the Western context. Um, and they hey, are of a similar upper middle class to very rich social strata. They are often educated with exactly the same background. Because to do this, we're not just talking about you know, going to coding camp. We're talking about like a series of very specific advanced degrees. Um, and this is, you know, for all the best intentions, and some of these people are my dear friends, that's a worldview. And that's a worldview that is embedded in, say, the features you choose to emphasize in your cat detection, right? That's a worldview that's embedded in how you, say, understand gender classification, how you understand some of these softer relational categories. That's a worldview that becomes baked into this technology that then you know, scales globally, you know, seriously globally, in ways that are sort of remapping you know, the world according to that vision. And that's, you know, we should be worried about that. And indeed, the data scientist Kathy O'Neill has termed yeah. a coin for algorithms that are secret and harmful, weapons of math destruction. Yeah, it's a good pun. So the, the key <laughs> thing, that, the one thing that would help discourse about these issues is to always remember that AI is, always will be, always should be nothing more than a tool designed, owned, managed, deployed by human beings. And so whenever you're talking about AI and its impact or its influence or claims, it's never claims by AI, it's claims about AI made by purveyors of AI. And so it's looking behind, you know, peeking behind the hood, looking who owns it, who designs it, who manages it, and it tends to be concentrated in, in, in certain ways. But and I would, 
Go ahead. I would just quickly add to that because I completely agree. We also look, need to look at whose power it serves. Yes. Because when we're talking about the workplace examples you gave, which I completely, you know, I, right on, right? When is the last time you went to a CVS and the automated checkout worked, right? It's not replacing us anytime soon. But what it is do, <laughs> <laughs> um, what it is doing is it is increasingly monitoring, surveilling, and determining which workers are, you know, valuable, good, and promotable, and which aren't. And of course, this is trained on data gathered from the current workforce, which shows, you know, deep Deep skews and inequity, and I can get into some examples there. But you know, this is this is a question of power alongside a question of exactly how the technology is constructed. And, Aviv? and just to add one thing in, about, beyond that, it's not just what power it serves, but it's also what power it entrenches. As in, as a result of this technology, like being deployed in this way, who now has more power than they had before, and what can they now do with that? Mm. Are there some areas? Do any of you feel? where this new technology should never be used, some institutions where algorithms should never be used? I think, you know, the, the question is not, do I want to put my foot down and say never here, ever? I think the question is, what proof do we have that they work, and how do we validate that? And in most cases, we have very little proof at all. We haven't even started developing the mechanisms to say, like, this is actually safe. This actually you know, works across populations. This actually does what the marketing department says it does. So I think the more sensitive the area we deploy it into, say, education, healthcare, et cetera, the more we have to wait until we have those techniques in place before we trust right. it. Yeah, I think that, that being said, though, I think it is interesting chasing after problems where you know, even if we did all that verification, turns out that it is better. Like that for other values and other reasons, we might still say no. Yeah. I think those classes are a very tricky set of classes where I think like in the justice context specifically, yeah. where we could actually imagine, well, maybe we actually do introduce these systems that are measurably better, but maybe there's something about justice or, or you know, providing the death sentence that actually requires like a human to be so, so, in yeah. so that So the relevant mood, question right? is yeah. what's better, right? Sure. Right. Better in terms of accuracy with respect to a scientifically defined or computation problem that sure. we can all agree on, or better in terms of some set of values in term that, that may very well be of fairness, uh, equity, due process, or other values that aren't necessarily easily captured in a, uh, in a, in a sort of an empirical question about accuracy. And so those are constantly trade-offs across a whole host of areas. So one way to think about it is, for every given uh, case to be made in favor of using AI as a tool in a particular context, uh, of the sort you were, uh, your like question raised. Like a private raised. doctor's office, for example? Right, so you should compare alternative tools. It, comparing various tools in context provides a means for thinking about accuracy, effects, power relationships, who's behind the tools, you know, where's the information flow that, you know, behind the scenes, or where is information uh, coming and going from. Uh, those are all a host of complex contextual variables that aren't easily even, you know, uh, captured in most of the conversations about AI. Yeah, and, um, I would also add that, that we, we, we need to also think about sort of what are the checks and balances that we're putting into place as we deploy these systems. Maybe it does make sense in this context, even, even in this criminal justice context, as we consider the trade-offs um, and, and our values around it, which is you know, absolutely <coughs> crucial. But then what are the checks to make sure that this is being used in the way that we want it to be used? Because if we're just dealing with you know, black box sy systems, that, that doesn't necessarily fly in some contexts. Right, and so now let's look at some more variables we have to add into this. This recent phenomenon of fake news, which first popped up before the 2016 election. We began seeing dubious news stories online that were engineered for maximum disruption. What happens when anyone can make it appear as if anything has happened, regardless of whether it did or not? Let's look at this short film we have on that difficult question. All this information is coming from all these different sources. And it's getting harder and harder and harder to understand and to figure out for, for ourselves what is actually true and what is not. And I want you all to know that we are fighting the fake news. It's fake, phony, fake. Fake news came out of the 2016 election. That, that's when it became a thing. One of the scariest advancements in AI recently has been uh, the uh, machinery that can be used to create fake video and fake audio. Especially our friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. I visited with the families of many of the victims on Thursday. I think the technology will get to the point where even a video forensic expert 
will not be able to tell what is actually fake and what is not. It wouldn't be far-fetched to think of it as being used as maybe a cause for war sometimes. A country releasing a video that shows other countries loading nuclear missiles you know, and ready to launch, they might use that as a cause to preemptively strike that country. Brett, you've come at this issue of fake news from a somewhat different perspective, I think. You say people often ask, how can people be so stupid to believe and engage this way? And you tell them the entire interface is made to make you believe this way. How is it so? Right, so uh, I got very frustrated when the fake news story, the story about fake news is sort of breaking, everyone's paying attention to it. How often I heard the, the, the meme, I guess, uh, that you know, people are stupid and lazy for believing in fake news. Um, and so I would, uh, I would suggest that a lot of the uh, people's susceptibility or propensity to believe what they're seeing on various platforms is, is a function of the design of the platforms. So if, it's, if you're on a social media uh, network, uh, to be named, you guys can figure out which one you want, um, if it's designed for, opti optimized in its design for rapid clicking, quick scrolling, um, or certain forms of engagement that the, based on profit, where the, where the money is to be made or where data is to be gathered, right, that uh, uh, sort of uh, disencourages uh, or disincentivizes people to stop and think or deliberate uh, or research or ask uh, deeper questions about the content that they're receiving. And so one, one species of fake news problem is a function of, um, you know, of, of making profit, right? Sort of max, uh, creating content to get clicked, right? They could care less, those purveyors of that kind of content could care less about convincing you or changing your beliefs. It's just click to make money, and the platform enables that. The other species is a species of content uh, that's all about propaganda or changing beliefs or influencing how someone approaches a problem. And oftentimes, that's not at all about making money. It's about changing beliefs. Um, and to deal with that, you need some form of judgment about the quality, the veracity, the uh, sort of provenance of the information itself, or the nature of the content. And our current social media platforms struggle on both fronts, both in terms of being designed for sort of certain kinds of engagement uh, that enable a for-profit uh, model, and on the other hand, uh, for not wanting to engage in the development of uh, editorial judgment or the exercise of editorial judgment by human beings um, because that, that risks putting them in sort of a content moderation uh, position. Now that's started to change since the, uh, the fake news sort of uh, right. story has broke. You, you've talked about this has created a diseased techno-social environment and that we're suffering from an engineered complacency. Uh, does that frighten any of you? Does it frighten you? Engineered complacency? Maybe I should explain what I mean, and then you guys can tell me if it frightens you. <laughs> it's meant to frighten, ah! Uh, no, but I mean, what, what I mean by engineered complacency is that much of the environment is designed in a way that repeat interactions in the environment lead you to feel as if you have, it's futile to resist, it's hard, there are no other options. So if you think about, uh, the easier example than the fake news context is maybe online contracting. Right, so what do you do when you see an I agree button pop up on a website? You know, not always, but most people, most of the time, click I agree, right? As you're supposed to, by virtue of both the design of the site and the interface, as well as the nature of the take it or leave it interaction that you're having, the nature of the transaction. Uh, plus, the fact that you, you repeat interactions with that interface over time, so even if you thought, you know what, maybe I'll stop and think about the legal relationship I'm in, entering into uh, for some of the websites that I'm visiting or some of the apps that I'm downloading or some of the devices I'm installing in, uh, in my home, um, how do you decide which of the many different encounters with the interface would cause you to stop and think? Indeed, that raises another question, are we actually changing the way the brain operates, to what effect? Is this uh, Tim? Well, I would say I'm not a neuroscientist, um, but I mean, I think there are, there is habit formation, right? Um, I think there's no doubt about that. And I think one of the things that Brett's pointing out, which I think is really great, is that your experience of certain elements online 
um, train you for how you behave in future experiences with that, yes. right? So I could even imagine a, a sort of strange world that we're in right now where we say everybody gets together and they all agree that this situation is really bad and we should do something about it. Mm -hmm. and, and we actually change like how the design of the software looks but actually people's behaviors are actually stuck in a format that will make those behaviors sticky over time, right? So you could actually imagine like, let's just bust up and shut down Facebook tomorrow, whether or not it actually recreates itself as a result of the fact that the market now is sort of entrained in certain ways. Um, I think that's an interesting possibility and a really challenging one if you think about the fact that these two variables are actually related, right? That, that people are influenced, but then they actually kind of influence the production of the system in return. I believe you're so. nodding vigorously. Oh, and I, I was just agreeing with that, I think, um, this is an, another example of sort of the entrenchment of power, where here it's not even power in a particular organization, but it's power in a particular um, almost like process or way of using your, yourself and your brain and, and your environment. And, I, mean, I would add, you know, I, I agree and I would say it, you know, and yet it is power in a particular organization. I have never known a product manager or engineer to, you know, get promoted for reducing engagement. Right, there are you know certain mm -hmm. types of incentive structures that are driving the culture and ecosystems of these companies. And even if you're engaging with sort of propaganda that is not there to make money for clicks, the longer you stay on a site, the more sort of adrenalizing content you're exposed to, the more ads they show you. Right, so there is a monetary incentive in these sort of ad, you know, ad business mm -hmm. platforms to keep people on the site, which I think. You know the politics of that are becoming clear. The risks of that are becoming clear, but the business model sort of remains pretty pretty sclerotic. Yeah, and I'd Brett. Love to, yeah, uh, I'd ahead. love to add like one wrinkle to this discussion though too, because I, I think a lot about the the sort of catch-22 that platforms find themselves in, right? Because they can say, okay, we're not gonna take action, in which case the public is like, you're negligent, you didn't take action. And they're like, okay, okay, so we're gonna take action. And then they're like, you're imposing your ethical will on me, right? And I think this actually is part of the tricky thing that needs to be dealt with, because I think when people ask the question, Facebook, do you have a responsibility here? The question is, like, should they be the ones who are delegated that responsibility? That ends up being, I think, a very interesting and, and tricky question. And I, I worry about situations where we say they could just do better, because in some ways it sort of reinforces their position in making a lot of these decisions as well, right? right? And so we may need to actually even rethink the, the sort of governance of how these so things are would, designed in a much bigger way. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Would, I would caution against us, them uh, uh, mentality in general. I mean, so I think, Oftentimes, but it's it varies by context and it varies by the technology we're talking about. I mean, the, the rest of you must have strong feelings about this. I mean, yeah, I, I wonder actually a little bit about, and I'm concerned about um, the sort of what I call the sort of the Overton window of crisis here. The over. Yeah, the Overton window of crisis. So Overton window, it's a concept from political science that talks about like what's politically acceptable. Right, and the notion is that certain events occasionally will happen that will widen that window, right, where someone um, breaks various norms in politics, and suddenly a whole lot of activity is allowed that it wasn't allowed before, or becomes plausible in a way that wasn't. Um, and I think there was a view actually early on around these privacy debates, which is, okay, people don't care about privacy right now, but we just need to wait until the first big crisis, right, and the first big data breach, and then everybody will care about privacy, right, and then that moment came and went, and it came and went, and came and went, and came and went. And you get this feeling now that actually like that like state of affairs has been normalized in a way that actually makes it quite difficult to mobilize change uh, politically within an industry. Um, you know, I was talking to a person who does product management recently, and I was like, "Oh, well, you know, this product you're building, you could kind of improve it in X, Y, Z ways." And he said, "Well, you know, we're gonna get we're gonna get blamed by the public anyways, no matter what we do. So we're just gonna do it, right?" And I think that's a really interesting phenomenon where basically the response has been so kind of built into the process that. Um, that creates a, a level of apathy onto itself. Yeah. And, and the effectiveness of dissent has been sort of right. muted so much that you know, that's just part of it. You, you know, look at the media for a while, the, you know, there may be some stories about it, but it's not actually, there is no sort of effective organizing. I mean, I, I guess another thing about this is, you know, I find the current framework of privacy kind of broken to talk about a lot of what we're speaking about, right? I don't, you know, I don't know that I've ever personally felt or detected 
harm from a privacy breach. Although, you know, I've been in all sorts of databases that have leaked because of, you know, egregious security practices. Um, but I do know that we have collective harms, right? And I think, you know, we, we need to begin thinking about these things collectively and we need to begin, you know, it's not, it's not I keep my personal data safe, it's that we have, you know, major interests, you know, the federal government and this sort of smartwatch or whatever it is, you know, large tech companies who are interested in understanding this data and then, you know, creating profiles of us based on the data. Right, uh, so I, I may mean, not have contributed my data, but I am suddenly profiled because there is a model about you know childhood activity that you know who knows where that's going to go. Is that going to be used to sort of you know weight college admissions? Will that be sent to insurance companies to see you know whose family gets insurance? Right, but we don't you know we have not asked for sort of transparency or oversight into these kinds of processes and assumptions. Um, and so when we talk about privacy, it's often sort of a very thin <coughs> debate because you know, I don't have time to do my laundry, let alone like read through a TOS and then take responsibility for where all of my data is, right? Aviv. And, and I think that one of the other things to really keep in mind here is that there are really hard trade-offs to be made when you're thinking about privacy. Um, so like one example is if let's you're talking about you know, misinformation in the 2016 election or even um, stuff that's being spread in, in um, let's say, in Myanmar, um, uh, where you might have people creating fake accounts, and those fake accounts are spreading this propaganda, right? Um, and that propaganda is causing violence or it's you know, misinforming voters. Well, how does a Facebook go and actually detect those fake accounts? Well, they're looking at the IPs of all these users. They're, they're looking at every single signal they can possibly get on that user and comparing it to what they know are sort of real users and to, to tell the difference. And so if, if they don't have that data, they, they can't make that comparison, then that makes their job a lot harder in protecting our democracy if they're actually trying to do that, which they now um, essentially are. And so I think that, that we really, there are some very, very difficult balances that we need to strike in order to ensure that we protect our democracy, we protect our privacy, we protect our ability to speak freely. All of these things are sort of in the balance and there's a lot of values that are, that are in tension. And so you set up the big question and we're now gonna, I guess, move to the inevitable, hopeful side of this. What are the, <laughs> if we can find one, what are the fixes? What are we to do? Tim. How can we make this AI more ethical? Sure, so one of the things I think about, particularly related to this discussion, um, is the delegation question that I mentioned a little while back, right? Which is that, particularly after 2016, we're kind of in this tough spot where we're basically like, companies just solve the problem. Well, well, we feel really uncomfortable about Facebook telling us what's true or not. All right, mm -hmm. well then let's pass a law. And then you're like, oh, well, like, we don't actually don't want governments to tell us what's true or not. And so there's actually this moment of like, we, we have to delegate to these two wolves where both of them, like we feel actually pretty uncomfortable working with them on issues of, of truth, for instance. And there, there seems to be like, there, particularly after 2016, there's, there's a general sort of implosion, I think, in our faith around the ability for like, communities to self-organize and deal with some of these problems um, themselves. And I think that there is good intellectual work to be done in terms of trying to figure out how platforms uh, can make those things more robust. All right, and Aviv, um, I see you nodding a great deal. And we're hearing also every week from the platforms that are stepping up, Twitter says it's going to limit tweets from people behaving badly, and Facebook has just detailed policing for sex, terror, and hate content. Do you think they're going far enough? I think um, there's a number of steps that are in the right direction. There's gonna be some steps that backtrack as we learn more, and as we discover that, oh wait, this isn't exactly what we wanted. Um, and I think that's part of this process, um, and I'm happy that we're actually on this process as opposed to just ignoring it, um, which was sort of you know, the status quo two years ago when you know, they said you know, fake news was a 2016 problem. That's in the US, right? A lot of the rest of the world has been um, you know, dealing with, with misinformation that's very deeply affecting their political systems for you know, five, 10 years even. Um, so I, mean, I think that there are some, um, some things that really do need to happen and they're starting to happen within these organizations um, in particular um, you've got, you know, empowered, like, you're, we need to have, like, empowered teams that can look at the impacts of the technologies on these things that we care about, on, on let's say, our democracy, on the, like, inter-community trust, so that you're not you're just increasing polarization. If you don't have someone who's paid to ensure that your platform isn't, like, deeply polarizing things, well, then your growth team that's trying to get more users and trying to get more action is, might unintentionally just do that. There has to be that back and forth, and they have to be empowered enough to sort of push back. Just to, this fascinating possible solution to some of it, empowered by whom? I mean, 
um, well, with both within the organization and ideally with some sort of external accountability, where you, you know, across these organizations, whether like there's a number of different structures, but the idea is that you not only have some sort of internal structure that's keeping an eye on, you know, this with people who their job responsibility is to maintain some of these things that we care about, um, but you also have outside of the company some way in which you're able to see, oh, is that company doing a good job at this? And whether that's you know through regulatory process, maybe maybe not. Um, but um, but I think that, that there has to be some structure that that creates those power dynamics. So an independent, idealistic, new profession that we need to live in this new world. I mean, I don't know that it's new. I mean, social scientists have been doing this sort of work for you know a million years. Um, but uh, um, uh, maybe not a million. Um, don't quote me on that. <laughs> maybe I don't know. <laughs> Feels like it. Um, um, but but I think the, the the combination of sort of the like people looking at how um, how the technology is impacting society and really sort of cross functionally and having teams that are doing that and and are that is their focus to understand the way these platforms are impacting things. And I think even beyond that, when you're talking about something like these deep fakes. Um, that's about not just research that's happening, not just stuff that's happening in these, these companies, in these platforms, but it's happening in research labs where you have researchers who are just like, oh, wouldn't this be cool? Oh, I can get a good paper out of this. And that's great. You know, I love good papers. I love cool things. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be looking at sort of what are the potential negative impacts. And one thing that I'm, I've been really excited to see is people um, within the academic community starting to really think about this deeply. And there's actually, as of now, um, as, as of like a few days ago, uh, the, if you go to like negativeimpacts.org, there's this, you know, um, this group, uh, the ACM Young Computing Fellow, or ACM Computing um, of the Future, something along those lines, where they're looking at the ways in which, uh, <laughs> uh, the ways in which we can improve the peer review process to really incorporate not just the, the positive impacts of a technology, but also keeping in mind the negative impacts. We have just a couple of minutes left. So your thoughts about where you, we're headed if we don't get, well, if we don't get. Uh, I mean, we're clearly headed to climate crisis. We're clearly headed to a lot of really serious issues that relate to this and don't relate to this. But I want to, I want to back up a little and you know make space for the question: What world do we actually want? Oh. Do we want Facebook to be? you know, negotiating with the U.S. government to determine sort of truthiness, or do we want Facebook, right? Is, you know, do we want late capitalism, right? What, is, what do we want this to be? And then think about what types of technologies could you build or avoid building to create that? Because I think we, get, we fall into the trap of accepting the status quo and then trying to tweak it around the edges. And it's very clear that that's not at this point working and that a number of the major social problems we're facing are enmeshed deeply with the major technological issues and they're being exacerbated in ways that are you know, very complex to tease apart from a systems perspective. So you know, I would want to start with the imaginative potential of how do we create a better world and then see do we want these sort of bulwarks of power in this world in that world uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt we have just one where, where are we headed it? if we don't fix it i think we're heading to a, uh, the you know science fiction dystopia where uh, we are more and more of our lives are determined are predicted and determined <laughs> by uh, technological systems controlled by a few uh, how we avoid that, the, the, 20, the constitutional most fundamental issue for us to confront in the 21st century is how to sustain our freedom to be off so that we're not always on. How to build techno-social environments through technology and social institutions that preserve underdetermined environments within which we can develop, play, experiment, interact with each other in ways that allow us to develop our own lives rather than have them determined for us. Sounds some, something for the lawyers, the politicians, and everybody to get involved with, including you nerds who have given us all this stuff. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause. Thank you for sharing.